Thanks, everyone. Welcome uh, to the 164th gathering uh, of the Great Lakes Policy Forum. I had to check that statistic uh, on my phone on the way in. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is one of the uh, oldest and, and longest running sort of semi-regular gatherings of, of people interested in following uh, Great Lakes policy and, uh, and U.S. policy in the region uh, here in Washington. We've been meeting uh, since 1996. Uh, gathering uh, the widest possible community of civil society, academics, government thinkers, as well as uh, members of the diaspora, students, and, and others who, who follow this region uh, very closely and, and discuss uh, sort of from 96 uh, up till now, there's been, been dramatic changes, and, and through it all, uh, this forum has, has brought uh, together a, a serious uh, Chatham House conversation uh, about uh, what, what's been developing uh, in the region. Um, this was the first of sort of our fall schedule, and, and before I introduce our panelists, uh, a quick plug uh, that our next one uh, will be working with, uh, will be hosting a, a professor from the uh, Free University of Bukavu talking about dynamics on the Rusizi Plains and local violence. That'll be in early September, and so if you haven't signed up uh, at the, the sign-in sheet, please, uh, uh, please do as we, we look for a busy fall in, in a busy region. Uh, so uh, today's topic is, is looking forward to the Congolese elections. Um, and we have a, an expert panel with us today, one that, uh, and, and an expert gathering of, of people in the room. And so we're looking forward to sort of a free uh, conversation. But we'll start with, with brief remarks. Uh, first off from uh, Stephen Sharp. Uh, Stephen uh, is the chief of party in, uh, the, in Kinshasa with Counterpart International. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Counterpart is one of the largest groups doing some really interesting uh, capacity building civil society support work around the world uh, on just about, I think, every continent and in just about every sector. Uh, but in Congo, they're doing a lot of work around uh, civic education and public engagement uh, through the elections process. And, and Stephen's a uh, beyond sort of that role, he's, which, which he's held since, since 2016, he's an excellent uh, commentator. Uh, he's run uh, democracy and governance programs uh, th around the world for counterpart. Um, but before that, uh, served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Monono Zaire, in Lisala Zaire, in Bandaka Zaire, and has remained uh, very deeply engaged with, with Congo throughout uh, his 20 plus uh, years. Uh, serving, uh, serving the, the cause of, of democratic uh, uh, governance. Uh, next to him, we have uh, Mvemba Dizolele, uh, a professor at this institution, uh, a scholar who, who many of you will know. Um, he has a forthcoming book uh, to uh, on Mobutu. Um, <laughs> forthcoming or has it come out already? Not yet. Not yet. It must have been the pre-order. Um, <laughs> so uh, so he, has a, he has a book uh, on Mobutu coming out. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen uh, he has an article on the Congolese elections and foreign affairs last week. Uh, it was very good. I, I certainly encourage everyone uh, to have a look. Um, but beyond that, he was an observer uh, to Congo's 2006-2011 uh, uh, elections with the, with the Carter Center. He was a reporter uh, embedded with Manuk in, uh, uh, I think it was Manuk at the time, in, uh, in Ituri in South Kivu, uh, and a very uh, deep and, and long-term term thinker about the, the country, its future. Uh, and its relationship uh, with the U.S. Uh, and finally, uh, we have Alexis Arieff. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Alexis uh, is a, one of the leading sort of thinkers at Congressional Research Service, although she's bashful, covering Francophone Africa. A Congressional Research Service is the independent uh, think tank research body that advises the U.S. Congress. So she's not here to speak today on either Congress's perspectives nor the administration or any other a sort of governmental body down the block, um, but rather uh, share some of the insight that she gives uh, to uh, our, our leaders and decision makers uh, as they weigh how the U.S. engages uh, with Congo and as we enter sort of a, a very eventful uh, time, not only in Congo, but in, in the bilateral uh, relationship. Uh, before uh, joining CR while at CRS, she's done details uh, at the Department of Defense, at the Department of State, and so she's well-placed to understand the U.S. intricacies, but was also uh, previously an elections observer to a number of Francophone countries, was an analyst at International Crisis Group and, and Freedom House, uh, and has uh, really been uh, a, a mainstay uh, of those of us who follow Francophone Africa. So thanks uh, to, to uh, all of our panelists for joining us on a uh, lovely 
uh, but metro impaired uh, DC, uh, uh, DC morning. And uh, let's start maybe if I can ask each of the panelists, starting with maybe Stephen, to, to give uh, us a briefing on, on where uh, you see things uh, at, at present, what the work is that you're doing. Uh, and then we'll come to, to Mvemba and uh, Alexis and, and leave plenty of time for, for questions and discussion. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, <clears throat> as Mike explained, Counterpart is implementing a, a civic and voter education program in Congo um, since, 19, uh, since 2015 um, and uh, informing uh, voters and citizens about uh, their rights as citizens to vote and uh, about the elections. Uh, and the elections were scheduled for 2016 and have had successive um, uh, anticipated dates, but it seems now that the elections that are scheduled for December 23rd uh, will likely uh, take place as planned. Um, what we do uh, primarily uh, in civic and voter education is to support local NGOs um, which uh, field um, community-based uh, animateurs who do the civic and voter education. And currently we're working with about 35 organizations uh, that have a total of over four, 500 people in the field conducting um, small-scale face-to-face sessions with community groups in churches and schools and public places like markets and, and um, public transport um, parking, um, parking lots. Um, the main uh, uh, tool that they use is um, large size posters, images um, that allow them to communicate with uh, either non-literate or low literacy um, uh, uh, populations. In addition, uh, we have a, a, a set curriculum that they use to explain about um, democracy, what is democracy, what are voters' responsibilities. It goes into voter registration, which we were heavily involved in last year, and then uh, what will happen when you get to the polling station and what to expect, and, and uh, then there's a final uh, module on uh, electoral conflict mediation. Uh, because the process has changed quite a bit since 2015 when we first started, we also use uh, a question and answer format, uh, fiche technique we call it, which we can disseminate very quickly that gives these um, community-based trainers information that is current to the situation at hand and not just what they were trained in um, when they initially began working. Uh, we also support uh, 90 community radio stations to broadcast uh, radio spots 30 to 45 seconds with this same information concurrent with the, the community-based outreach and, and information. Um, then uh, we also have uh, citizen forums and um, uh, Tribune d'Expression Populaire, which is a, a, f a, a forum which allows citizens to meet with local government authorities or people from the election commission and ask them questions and give feedback on the process as it, it's uh, unfolding at the time. Um, and then we have a series of visual uh, messaging such as uh, posters, uh, banners, uh, t-shirts, um, which also carry messages about voting, encourage women to vote, encourage youth to vote, encourage peaceful participation in the elections. Um, and to date, uh, I'll, I'll admit we've had a lot of time to work on it. Uh, we've reached uh, 3.2 million people with the face-to-face -face, uh, information sharing that I described to you and over 20 million through the radio campaign. There are about 40 uh, million registered voters, so we've reached about, we feel like we've reached about half of the uh, potential voting population and we're present through the NGOs that we support in 16 of 26 provinces. So I'll stop there because I'm sure you'll have questions and I can respond to those more in detail. Awesome, thanks. And, and maybe if we, uh, that, thanks for that introduction. I, I think that's rich, rich fodder for, for conversation. And maybe let's turn to, to Mvemba and uh, you can share some of your, your look both at the historical arc as well as sort of where we are now on the, 
the electoral outlook? Um, thanks, uh, Mike. So the DRC, I think the situation in DRC always makes, only makes sense when you contextualize it. So it's always about the context and the subtext of the messages that comes out. It's what we see and then is what is said in between. Uh, so it's important for us to remember how we got here. We got here because in part, um, starting in 2006, where there was a legitimacy, uh, a modicum of legitimacy that was given to the regime, uh, if we can use that term. It's hard to talk about regime in DRC, to Kabila after the elections. Uh, that election was actually a culmination of a hard work, both on the part of the Congolese themselves, uh, coming out of f five, four years of, um, of conflict, and then working, I mean, out an agreement out of Sun City in, uh, in South Africa that eventually led to the transition and uh, eventually to the elections, which, depending on where you stood, was relatively good and was acceptable as the result. But then quickly after that, in the interim, the next five years, I think Kabila worked hard, Kabila and his associates worked hard to undo and untangle all the gains that had taken place then. Uh, in other words, instead of delivering, they were more concerned about what do we do next so we stay longer. Um, they changed the constitution, just to give an example, uh, moving from two round election to one round. And this was telling because this was done specifically to try to undermine Chisekedi. Uh, an old man who was dying in Europe, woke up in this coma, so to speak, and decided, well, I can run. And Kabila panicked and they decided to do this. But the result was that Kabila became very unpopular and it actually exposed how weak he was. Because though it was one round in 2011, Kabila could not win. In certain instances, uh, just to give you a sense, uh, in certain instances, like in Mbankulu and other areas, Kabila won by 100.12%. So even the dead came out to vote for him. Uh, this means he could not garner the very basic you know, percentage that was required. In other words, if you win by 25%, you become president. That's what he had wanted. So you think with the entire apparatus working for him, it should have been easier, but it was not. So that triggered a constitutional crisis in which we still find ourselves today. Because quickly we had two people declaring victory. One was Kabila, who went to the military camp and swore, took his oath of office as, the, as a president for the second term. The other one was Etienne Chisekedi, who took the same oath in his house. You know, literally like that. So then from that on, Kabila continued to work hard and harder, tried to continue to legitimize himself. The more he tried, the weaker he got. So within the context of the region, it's also very telling because as we know, Central Africa is pretty much the basket case of Africa. Uh, everybody who holds office want to turn into a little king and stay longer. This goes from Congo Brazzaville, if you want, from Equatorial Guinea, all the way to Kigali, from Bangui all the way to Luanda. So it's a very tough neighborhood that way. Um, a lot of them, we see what's happening in Uganda today, a lot of them man, manage so-so. Kabila is really struggling with that. So two years in, um, they refused, after it became so complicated for them to go to the election in 2006, to, to respect the constitution, they just, decide using what they're good at, which is a delaying tactics and passive aggressiveness. Um, so they refused to fund the elections for a long time. They just say, we don't have money, we cannot do this thing. Um, so the result has been mobilization, popular mobilization. Masses have taken to the street. You have heard of Filimbi, Lucha, and many other groups that we cannot even name here or that we don't even know. But they've been strong mobilization. We've seen in places like Katanga where Moise Katumbi has managed to garner his own support, and every other week there is, there is rally of, a rally of sorts. We see that uh, abduction and uh, political kangaroo courts have continued. So the penitentiary center in Makala is full of, if you're on Twitter and social media, you get to learn a lot of, name a lot of people, but all these people are tweeting from jail, right? It's actually interesting because you say, but this is a prison. Yes, but he tweets every day. You're like, wow, that's kind of, uh, I don't know what that means about the prison system in Congo. 
but people do tweet from, from their cell, and they can tell you what's happening in Kinshasa. It's actually more interesting to listen to them or read what they're saying, because they tend to know more about what's happening in the city. Um, so the result has been multifaceted as the regime, quote unquote, has continued to push to undermine the process. Popular mobilization, we also saw tremendous mobilization of the international community, right? Uh, we saw this with special envoys appointment. Literally any country that disbursed money in Congo is a special envoy. This goes from the UK to Sweden, to France, to the US. So there's been tremendous pressure. On one level, the regime act like as if they're ignoring the pressure. But again, here comes the subtext. The Congolese government, if you go on FARA and you type to see how many contracts Congo has in terms of lobbying representation, you'd be surprised. It's probably the country with the most contract in that region. Uh, countries like Zambia has no representation whatsoever. Then you look at Congo, you have the government that has representation. You have the electoral commission, which has its own lobbying groups in Washington. You have private citizens like Katumbi with their own lobbying group, and a lot of other people in between that I don't even know, that, but you see their names. So this is just to tell you how the government or the various forces in Kinshasa are reacting to this pressure. And this is to say that pressure is working internally and externally. In fact, in this side of the equation, the international community equation, we remember Ambassador Nikki Haley going to Kinshasa and literally cornering the system, the regime, to give a date. Now, we think they could have done better than letting them decide that it's going to be December 23rd, but we are still thankful that December 23rd came about because that gave us a target date to work towards. Now, before we celebrate that, we have to continue looking at the subtext of things. Um, in that interim, we saw the release of Jean-Pierre Bemba from The Hague. Uh, this is significant because whatever people thought of Jean-Pierre Bemba, a lot of Congolese saw him as a victim of the international system. The Congolese want justice, but they want justice for crimes committed in Congo. So the fact that Bemba had been arrested for some stuff that happened in CAR is good for the people of CAR to get justice, but that didn't resolve the equation, the quagmire for the Congolese perspective. The Congolese would have wished that the issue on the table be the issues of the crimes, quote unquote, committed in Congo, in which case that entire cast of characters, all the former militia leaders, armed group leaders will have been on notice, and probably a lot of them will have been deferred to the, uh, to the, ICE, uh, to the international court. That did not happen. So the fact that he spent 10 years in, uh, in, at The Hague was seen as the international community doing the bidding for Joseph Kabila to get his main opposition character out of the way for him. Um, and we saw that during those 10 years, um, Congo has not made progress. On the contrary, we are in the crisis we are. So will it have been different if Bemba had stayed? I don't know. All we know that he had a certain gravitas, he had a certain base, he had challenged Kabila successfully on the, battle, on the battlefield and at the pole. He had forced a runoff in 2006, so he had emerged as one of the strongest opposition leaders in parliament. Had he stayed, would he have given the offset of all the stuff that we've seen in the interim? Probably, but we, of course, will never know. So these are kind of the, the background and the subtext. So let's go back now, since he's, Bemba has been back, the same day Bemba came back, just to give you a sense, um, he was refused access to his residence in Kinshasa. Uh, but we saw how many millions or hundreds of thousands of people showed up, it's hard to tell the number to welcome him when he landed. So, but he was literally refused access to his own house. Uh, two days or three days later, Moise Katumbi decided to show up but he showed up on the side of the Zambian border in Kasumbalesa. He was refused access to, uh, to Lubumbashi as well. Um, and then the government continued, the Minister of Justice continued to dangle this idea that we may disqualify Bemba or might disqualify so and so. So Congo is holding his breath now. In the next few days, we should know who's been disqualified as a presidential candidate and who's not. Um, if they disqualify Bemba, that will only add to the crisis. 
Uh, Katumbi is not back. We had the president of the Senate, Ken Guadondo, a couple of days ago mention that, well, maybe Katumbi has to ask for forgiveness, for amnesty from the president, so he should come back. Uh, that part of the subtext, what does that mean? Does it mean now the, tr the testing the balloon out there, kind of to see, will this be acceptable where we can delay the entire thing? So instead of the 23rd, maybe let, let Katumbi come back, maybe let's open up the process again, Maybe, maybe, maybe Kabila loves dialogues. They buy him time, right? It's, it's, it's a delaying tactic. So within this context, then, what do we do next? I think we need to continue. We, meaning the Congolese in, uh, inside, have to continue putting pressure on the leaders so the process goes forward, um, particularly on the Electoral Commission. In my view, we have a president of the Electoral Commission who's actually posing a threat to the entire system. Uh, Congolese complain all the time. We complained 2006 about Malu Malu. We didn't think he was doing what should have been done. And then 2011 came, then we saw that Malu Malu was better than the guy who was there. At the time, it was Mulundangoy. It was a different set of issues. And now, when you analyze this, people feel like, oh, we thought he was bad with Malu Malu. We thought he was bad with Mulundangoy. This is really the worst we can get. Um, and in many ways, it sounds like this is the worst that we can get because um, the, other, the, the previous Electoral Commission president tried at least to give that sense of independence. They engage in a certain way. We might have issue with their own personalities, but they did what they could. Uh, Kone Nanga doesn't hide anything. I mean, he's the, uh, I've sat in a lot of meetings where he's been in town. He's the, he's the only Electoral Commission president that I know who tells you why they should not have elections. Literally, you wonder, why did you accept this job? But any time you spend some time with him, he always gives you all the reason why the Constitution is wrong, why we should not have this this way. And by the way, I have two, three lobbying groups for me to tell you why I'm saying what I need to say. Uh, he shows up in meetings with the uh, government people where he's supposed to be independent. I don't know what that means. I've never seen him in a meeting with the opposition or with civil society. Uh, those are signs that actually make people very uncomfortable. He uh, insists on having this electronic voting machine, which is not part of the process. It's not been part of the process before. It's not tested. Um, with the issues of fraud, this is actually set to be a major problem. So it, it appears that unless we put pressure on people like Cornel Nanga and his deputies, we risk finding ourselves with the most chaotic um, elections, if they happen uh, in DRC, which will be rejected by all parties. And if they are, then Kabila stays in power until there's a new president, which can take another five years, can take all kind of thing. So it sounds a bit bleak, but then it's a very dire situation, it's just as it appears. If we don't push it, uh, if we don't push for more engagement, positive, then we actually can bet that there will be more proliferation of conflict. Conflict itself has been moving. We have two sets of conflict in DRC. We have the armed conflict, which make the news every day. That's the corridor from Ituri to Northern Katanga. But we've seen that conflict start mutating and moving to the Kasai and other places. So we don't know how far that will go. The other conflict that we don't always quantify well, doesn't make the newspaper, is the, the, the civil disobedience. This is actually where the government is having the most difficult time. Because when you have people in civil disobedience space, it's very difficult to buy them off. Mm -hmm. You can buy off the Mai Mai militia leaders. You can make them colonel in your military. You can give them one star and two stars and a villa on the banks, uh, on the shores of Lake Kivu. You cannot do that with the luchas of the world, with the filimbis of the world. So what you do, you crack down. And when you crack down, you shed blood. And when you shed blood, people want more of mobilization. So there's a lot there. Hopefully this also will uh, you know, get more of interest in Q&A. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Mbemba, thanks, Mbemba and, and thanks for that um, sobering look at, at sort of the political dynamics as, as you see them in Congo. Maybe turning now to Alexis and sort of the political dynamics here in the States in terms of the, the relationship and sort of some of the the analysis both of where we've been and, and what we might expect uh, going into what uh, will be both a busy but also a very um, 
you know, potentially fractious uh, election season. Absolutely, um, thanks. Uh, uh, so as Mike mentioned up front, um, I'm going to try to thread the needle of describing sort of where US policy stands today as, as insofar as I'm able to observe it sitting at the Congressional Research Service. Um, but I don't speak on behalf of the US government. Uh, CRS is an analytic entity sort of one can understand our role as that of an uninformed observer. Um, and then I'll touch a little bit on congressional activities around DRC, and I'm happy to go more into that in the Q&A if anybody's interested. Um, so as, uh, as I think Bemba has already laid out very um, eloquently, the, the ruling party's nomination of uh, Emmanuel Ramzani Shadri as its candidate to contest the December elections uh, in a way has shifted international engagement away from, it, from a previous single-minded focus on pressing Kabila to clarify that he intended to step down and not contest what would have been uh, an arguably unconstitutional third term, um, and toward an emphasis on ensuring that elections happen as scheduled in December, and to some extent toward assessing the credibility of the electoral process. Now, that sounds straightforward, um, but uh, as I think people in this room know well, uh, the question of how to gauge the credibility of these elections uh, and when to sort of make a determination in that regard has um, consumed uh, the discussion here in Washington about, about DRC. Um, and a, a related element of the US stance toward DRC is sort of a question of how to assess the degree of local support for either the election results, assuming elections happen, or uh, any other scenario that could emerge between now and December. Um, so there's been an ongoing discussion between the advocacy community here in Washington um, and the US government over when and how to uh, assess that the election still retains the potential to be credible um, and uh, to what effect, you know, if such an assessment were made one way or the other. Um, so sort of what tools might be on the table uh, if it is clear um, that the elections are not capable of delivering a result uh, that, that is credible. Um, and this uh, very issue came up, in, for example, in the recent ambassadorial nomination uh, uh, hearing for the, for the new ambassador to DRC uh, in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Um, without where senators pressed uh, Ambassador Designate uh, Hammer to clarify sort of on what grounds the U.S. would assess that the elections had been uh, or that election results had been credible, but without sort of much of a response, uh, at least on the record in that public setting. Um, so uh, as Vemba laid out, there are plenty of reasons for observers to doubt the credibility of the electoral process as it stands today and even going back to you know, as far as 2015 when the first preparations um, began for the polls that were ultimately delayed until this year. Um, nearly two thirds of Congolese respondents in a recent nationwide poll conducted by the Congo Research Group uh, reported that they did not trust the CENI to organize a free and fair vote. Um, so this echoes sort of analysts assessment for several years now about a, the appearance of political interference and other irregularities in the electoral process. Um, I, uh, I think Vemba has well laid out sort of some of the suspicions and, and reasons for that suspicion um, among both Congolese and external observers. Um, donors, including the United States, have in fact been wary of providing direct technical support to the CENI uh, in the absence of a more precise CENI budget proposal and other sort of uh, reforms and signs of political will toward organizing a, a competitive uh, process. The DRC government, for its part, has referred to donor election support as foreign interference um, and stated uh, just a, a week or two ago that unlike in 2006 and 2011, it would not accept UN logistical assistance for moving electoral materials across what is a vast and infrastructure poor country. So I, I don't know if the final word has been said on MINUSCO's support to the electoral process, but this is a core component of MINUSCO's current mandate. Um, and many observers think that it would be very hard to just on a technical level organize these elections nationwide without that kind of logistical assistance. Um, as uh, Vema noted, um, recent, the recent interview by Kengo Wadondo and, and other sort of 
moves, including uh, Shadari's nomination, have raised suspicion among some Congolese and some observers that uh, sort of Kabila can't be counted out entirely, that we could be looking toward um, some kind of uh, bid at a new political dialogue or some other maneuver that would again extend the pre-electoral period. Um, it's hard to handicap the odds of that, um, but, uh, but that would certainly be one scenario that would pose a challenge to uh, US policymakers in terms of um, having very much emphasized this December 2018 date as, as the final deadline um, for an election. Uh, to step back um, a little bit, that, that is only one of several scenarios that could pose a major challenge to US policy in the coming months. Um, so a further electoral delay, maybe with the consent of some kind of opposition uh, uh, or um, even regional elites, you know, some kind of buy-in that legitimizes a delay, that would be one. Um, another that Mbemba noted is if more top opposition candidates are effectively or legally barred from running, as has already been the case with uh, Moise Katumbi. Um, or if we uh, take at face value the Shadari nomination and assume that elections may well occur on December 23rd, I think a, a, a scenario that would be challenging for the US would be if Shadari wins election uh, in a way that um, strains credulity. Uh, and if his victory is, for example, contested by local observers, but accepted and legitimized by regional leaders. Um, and I think that would put us in a scenario somewhat analogous to the aftermath of the 2011 elections, um, but in a very different sort of domestic political context within DRC, um, which would be harder to manage. Um, the, to sort of describe the broad outlines of US policy toward DRC in the current moment, the Trump administration has focused high level attention on encouraging an electoral transfer of power in DRC pressing for, and this is the State Department's term, credible elections, um, again, to be defined perhaps at a future date, um, in which Kabila is not a candidate. Uh, top US officials, including Ambassador Nikki Haley and US aid administrator Mark Green, have expressed concern about the government's non-implementation of confidence building measures in the 2016 political agreement, that is to say, uh, the government's failure to implement sort of a, a more open political environment ahead of elections, um, and have urged the government to, as um, Administrator Green put it in March, foster the conditions that make true democracy uh, possible. So this is going beyond just a concern with sort of the narrow near-term election itself. Uh, the administration, as you all know, has expanded the US targeted sanctions program uh, in an effort to deter human rights abuses and obstruction of the democratic pro process, and uh, has also issued a travel ban against certain unnamed senior DRC officials. Um, to, to talk about the congressional angle a little bit, um, so there has been longstanding congressional attention to DRC. Uh, unlike many Francophone African countries, uh, there is actually a body of legislation uh, that deals with DRC and US policy and aid toward that country. Um, since 2016, congressional attention toward DRC has, like the executive branch, focused on deterring uh, an effort by President Kabila to cling to power um, and deterring sort of human rights abuses around the elections process. Uh, there was a, a bill introduced in the House in June that would codify existing U.S. sanctions um, for DRC and could, uh, depending on how it were implemented, if enacted, uh, could compel the executive branch conceivably to make new targeted sanctions designations. Uh, there is a resolution that was agreed to in the Senate uh, just a few weeks ago that calls on President Trump to use quote, appropriate means, unquote, to assist elections in DRC and deter further electoral <laughs> calendar slippages and abuses against the people of Congo, among other provisions. Um, these uh, pieces of legislation arguably escalate and build on uh, resolutions passed in the last Congress by both the House and Senate that used similar terminology uh, to the Senate resolution. Um, more broadly, Congress has often focused on human rights uh, concerns uh, and challenges in DRC, um, more broadly, more uh, consistently focusing on conflict-related uh, human rights concerns, such as sexual violence, the use of child soldiers, the international trade in conflict minerals. 
Um, and for nearly a decade, Congress has used uh, foreign, foreign aid appropriations measures to seek to deter regional involvement in DRC's conflicts, notably by Rwanda and Uganda. Um, so there is a, an enduring sort of provision in the foreign aid bill uh, that um, restricts certain types of military assistance to countries around DRC that could be found to be intervening in support of rebel groups in DRC. Um, Congress has also enacted legislative restrictions on certain types of aid for countries that, like DRC, have a poor record on human trafficking or use of child soldiers, as I mentioned, and those have sort of affected the scope and uh, weight of U.S. Uh, aid to DRC over time. All of that said, uh, it's important to recognize that U.S. influence in DRC is constrained by various factors, uh, limited resources, a perceived need to maintain bilateral diplomatic ties, uh, and the challenge of coordinating with and influencing other key players that may have more immediate stakes in DRC, notably countries in the region, um, but also European donors um, and China. Um, and since I mentioned Europe, I, I uh, meant to flag a further challenge for US policy if uh, we assume that Shattery's nomination is made in good faith and if he could actually win the election. Uh, Shattery is under European Union targeted sanctions um, for his role in overseeing uh, brutal political repression in 2016, 2017 as then interior minister and, and uh, vice prime, prime minister. <laughs> um, so uh, he is not under US sanctions, but that obviously could complicate uh, US relations conceivably with a future Shattery government. Um, but in any case, to, to loop back to US um, constrained influence. Um, U.S. bilateral aid does not present obvious opportunities for leverage, although this is debated among advocacy groups here. Um, as many, if not most, U.S. programs are implemented through non-government partners and seek to address humanitarian development and or human rights problems. Um, U.S. bilateral military aid might be an exception, so about $10 million was al allocated for bilateral U.S. military aid to DRC in FY17. Um, but uh, the State Department has premised those programs on focused, focusing on human rights challenges within the DRC military and sort of accountability, military justice. So uh, whether suspending some of that funding or, or curtailing it would actually have an impact on DRC policy is, is somewhat in question. So that shift back to Mike. Excellent. <laughs> well, th thanks for, for those two presentations. And, and one of the things I really value about these kind of forums is, is combining sort of the Washington and sort of policy side of things with realities on the ground as well. And one thing, Stephen, that struck me from your presentation um, was just, ha having worked in Congo myself, just the enormous task that, that you know, Counterpart is, is undertaking, um, you know, 20 million radio listeners and, and 3.2 million face-to-face -face meetings with, I'm not sure how many civil society groups you're working with, but that must be an enormous task. And, and I was wondering before we turn it in, I know there'll be a lot of questions. Um, what does that look like for you? Like, who are you guys working with? How are you, you know, who are your partners? And as you meet with 3.2 million people about the elections, what does that look like? Like, what are you hearing from I presume they're not all urban. I presume they're not all sort of elites. What, what are women telling you around the country? What are people in the, in the hinterlands talking and thinking about uh, as you engage with them, uh, as they start to think through the elections process and how they'll participate? I'd be really curious just to, to hear a bit more about what that, what that looks like sort of in reality and in, in, in places outside of, of conference rooms in whether Washington or Kinshasa. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, we are currently working with about 35 local Congolese NGOs, <clears throat> and they were selected uh, competitively uh, based on previous work in civic education and uh, community outreach. Um, and we provide uh, both funding and technical assistance to them to carry out these um, civic education um, <clears throat> messaging programs. Uh, each of the, the, the current portfolio, each organization has between 15 and 20 um, community-based animateurs who organize between three and four um, sessions with community groups and others every month. So these are basically stipended volunteers who have standing in their community um, and who carry out these um, uh, 
uh, orientation sessions uh, where they live. Um, and they uh, also, we have selected groups that focus on women, on youth, on um, other marginalized uh, populations to ensure that we, we reach beyond just sort of generally broadcasting um, the, the message. What surprised us um, in late 2017, because I, I described briefly the curriculum or, the, or the, the messages that we communicate from what is democracy to how do you register to vote to how do you vote. And at the end of 2017, the voter registration program had pretty much completed. The, the two um, Kasai provinces uh, had been held up by the, uh, their, their registration process had been held up by conflict there. Um, and so the next step was to inform people how to vote, and we weren't having elections at the end of 2017. What we found was that people were still very much interested in understanding democracy. They wanted to understand how the system worked and how they would participate and what their responsibilities were. The concept of um, transition of alternance was frequently, you know, what does that mean? How does it happen? Obviously, the presidential election, and that's mostly what we've talked about here, is, is what people are focused on, but there will also be National Assembly elections in December and Provincial Assembly elections, so people are also preparing for those and, and are very much interested in how that will play out, particularly in, in the context of decentralization which is currently taking place as well. And people will be voting for their uh, provincial assemblies and those assemblies will elect governors and there will be local government elections in 2019 if the calendar that, is, that we're currently operating under holds. Um, in terms of what people are saying, there's a lot of, of suspicion about the process uh, we, I, I neglected to mention in my, in my opening remarks, we support the, the National uh, Independent Electoral Commission, the CENI, in their civic education outreach. Uh, we, ha we do not have a, a formal relationship with them, but we work very closely with them, and all the messages that we and our partners convey are vetted with the CENI so that we're consistent with the CENI's um, approach to informing people about the elections. But there's a lot of suspicion. Uh, people, um, when they're informed about certain procedures, there's kind of a scoffing, well, yes, that's the way it's supposed to go, but can we be assured that that will happen? Will the elections date hold? Um, there's a lot of concern about the voting machine that Vemba mentioned. Um, people, by and large, have only heard about it, have not seen it. Um, do not really know what it is, except that um, they've heard that it's bad or they've heard from the CENI that it's a good thing for the electoral process, that it will bring a certain um, efficiency um, and cost savings to the process. Um, there are um, also concerns about will the elections happen? And obviously for with all of the uh, delays and reschedulings that have taken place, it's a, it's a justified concern. Yeah, that's, um, that's super helpful. And it's, you know, I think one of the things that struck me from you know, working on civic education and working in past Congolese elections, just the enormity of the task that you're, you're undertaking and, it, you know, the, the, how many devils and challenges are in the details um, in, in getting, you know, the, the word out and, and engaging with people throughout the the, the the enormity of the of the country and, and in that challenge and so very much uh, cognizant and appreciative of all the work that, that you and your your civil society partners as well as the the CENI outreach teams are are doing to uh, uh, to get that out because that's certainly not not a, an easy task but let's um let, let's turn it out to questions I think we're going to do questions one by one until we get a little bit pressed on time so I'll, uh, uh, do we have microphones? Uh, excellent. We have one microphone. So let me turn it to the gentleman in the, the first uh, row. I, I expect we'll have a lot, so we'll keep it short. And if we can direct each one to one panelist, and that way we can 
Okay, okay. keep it moving. Should I stand up or no? Please, please stand. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Gustavo and I'm with the uh, Committee for Free and Democratic Equatorial Guinea. So I'd like to pose my question to Mr. Mbemba. Um, First of all, um, I've been coming to these since the days of the late Howard Wolpe. I'm embarrassed about the African continent. We're talking about things that, that should be resolved decades ago. Election rigging, uh, non-transparent elections, dictators who think that they, they, they are the warehouse of all information of the continent. So it's gotten to a point to where when I hear this, I think of Mr. Wolpe. So in the 21st century with regard to the Congo, and I'm from Equatorial Guinea, we, all, we know that most of these dictators can be taken out like, uh, through elections, through sanctions, but there's a pathology, I think, within multinational corporations and the U.S. government to keep ignorant folks in power, to keep them in order for them to be manipulated. So with regard to diaspora, whether in the Congo or Equatorial Guinea or other countries, what can the U.S. government really do in terms of dealing with the diaspora as opposed to the technocrats, which often get in the way of things being able to prop, to move in a very progressive, effective manner? Because as far as I'm sure, this is a dog and pony show, and the Kabilas of the world, the Bias of the world, the Bongos of the world, who you would not allow to run a general store in Warrington, Virginia, are now running these countries, rich in diamonds, oil, and minerals. So I ask you this question as a fellow African and proud of what you're doing with regard to keeping these folks accountable for the atrocities that they brought, in, brought to the African continent. I don't think there's much debate there. <laughs> well, thank you for your comment and question, Gustavo. I mean, um, it's a challenging question uh, in the t sense that, first of all, diaspora cares. Typically, they're in the diaspora because there's a problem at home. Most Africans are not here because they enjoy the winter here. <laughs> yeah. No, I, no I'm, just, I'm just contextual. No, correct. So because of that context, at least for the Congolese diaspora, most people are just trying to eke out a living. Um, so we have a lot of discussion among ourselves, various diasporas, even just to hold people to come to invite people to meetings is a challenge. Uh, people are working two, three jobs. They're sending money home. So they're carrying that burden already. Um, so a few of us can afford, quote unquote, to come to sessions like this. 99% of those people can't. Their families, they're trying to raise here. They're trying to deal with immigration. Immigration issue these days. The all kinds of things that make people, they care, but they're so tired, just tired by the end of the day. Uh, how does the US engage? I don't know. I don't know what the best um, engagement is, literally. I don't know. I think if a person says, this is the way they should do it, um, I, I'm curious to hear that. Maybe we can talk later, but I don't know. I mean, uh, the U.S. government itself, it's not monolithic. It comes and goes. It, it defined by personalities. Um, I know state has tried to organize a lot of fora once in a while with the, the diaspora. Uh, but how far does it go? You know, the good people, the typically middle-level civil servant, how much power they have in actually implementing or doing what the diaspora recommends. There are a lot of recommendations. Uh, the other element is also the diversity of the diaspora itself. Uh, a country like DRC is so big, with various interests. Uh, issues are not always seen the same way. Somebody who lives in Bukavu has a different perspective on what's happening because, of course, they're affected by armed conflict and blah, blah, blah. Somebody who lives in Kinshasa is seeing the thing totally differently. Uh, somebody who lives in Bakongo is seeing the things differently. So when you put all of us Congolese in the room, and say, what should we do? That itself is informed by the various perspective. We may agree that Kabila must go, but what does that look like next? Uh, a Katangan might believe only Katumbi can be president. Everybody else believes, no, Katumbi is not qualified. So how, how do you deal with that kind of stuff? So it's a, the other extreme is what we saw with Iraq. You know, we had, we had the diaspora that seized the entire crisis. Next thing we know, the U.S. was invading Iraq. It, was that the will of the entire Iraqi diaspora? I don't know. People like 
Ahmed Chalabi really, they had the voice, so they capitalized on that voice, find some kindred spirit on the side, and next thing we know, we have the mother of all wars, to quote Saddam Hussein. Yeah? So it's, it's fraught with all kind of danger in that sense. But the, the, the thought is much more, it's well taken, and I think we have a, a, um, a job to do here. But how do we engage? Engaging the US is one thing. Uh, those of us who write and talk and go to Congress, thank God for the US, because this doesn't work in Europe. It doesn't work the same way. Here we can go to the Hill. I can go to USAID. I can, we can have six, seven Congolese and say, Congressman, you need to do X, Y, Z. And a lot of time they deliver. It may not be there. They have resolutions. We have sanctions. This is actually in part the fruit of the labor of the diaspora. I'm going to be hard pressed to go to the Norwegian parliament, to the steward thing, and find anybody who's been let me on the ground. Right? Be Correct, but that's, that's an American system, so it allows access to your, your, your representatives. The rest of the world does not allow for that. It's not structured that way. So we actually live in a unique position in the US, and I think we're thankful for that. Every Congolese knows this. I'm sure Equator Guineans who live here know this as well. So we're really privileged. How does that translate over there? It's another story. Well, Bob Ombeck yes. was recently uh, suggested to be a special envoy Correct. Yes. You have Africans who are rejecting Africans. Uh, the U.S. wanted to. I mean, where do you go? I mean, you go to Mars, Elon Musk. I mean, you <laughs> it's a challenging question, but we should continue discussing. Thanks. Yes. I, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm Malcolm O'Dell. I work in grassroots community empowerment, women's empowerment. Uh, and uh, spent some time project design and management training in Kinshasa. I was there recently, and if you'll bear with me for just a minute, I'll tell you a story. We'll I bear with you for Kinshasa. one minute, but, yeah. uh, but <laughs> we only to, have, uh, that'll be 20, I, I, one of yeah, our 25 I, left. It leads to my question, and I, I don't know any other way around it. I was in Kinshasa giving a management training course of USAID people, and in the course of them, some of them said, oh, o Odell, Odell, uh, uh, are you related to Dr. Marsha? I said, well, that's my wife. And they said, oh, oh, that WORTH program, that WORTH program. She started that with PACT about 15 years ago. It's still going strong, and it's the best thing we've ever seen in this country. And Richard Cook Robinson at the embassy at the time said, yeah, you know, it's still out there. Uh, and I took the ambassador in my Subaru across the country. I was, I was born here and raised here. I took them across the country, and they, those women groups are still out there, and they're still carrying on by themselves uh, years later. Uh, anyway, long story short, there was a program started out of Lumbabasi, and it's a grassroots program started by PACT. Uh, women's groups, 20 women's groups, hundreds of groups were formed, never got to the big conflict areas, but there's a video on it that Bread for the World put out, and it was given a whole bunch of awards. Laura Bush wanted to visit uh, Central Africa and, and, and uh, wanted to visit one of these groups, and they did a big check with all the security and administrator. U.S. aid director in Congo said, oh, yeah, that, that's a good program. She should see it. It's the best program I've ever seen in my career. I want it everywhere in Congo. Well, of course, he was transferred. It never happened. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it never got beyond the few hundred groups down in the Lumumbashi area. But what you're doing in the grassroots, I don't hear people demonstrating against you, trying to throw your people out of the country. I don't hear, uh, you know, that the NGOs you're working with are getting in trouble with the government. Maybe they are. Certainly, PACs, Women Empowerment, never did. The women carry on. There's, the women have beaten up back domestic mm -hmm. violence. They've beaten back trafficking. They're doing it by themselves, but they're, they're not getting any support. I see maybe there's no answer at the top right now. Maybe there's no answer in the Congress or at, at Kinshasa. But if we can support grassroots initiatives like yours, like PACTS and others, working with the people, you're going to bubble up democracy. Those women are running democratic savings groups. They understand that. Can't we do more at that end while things continue to fall apart at the top? Sure. So we don't have to be embarrassed any longer? Sure. Thanks, Thanks for that reflection. And maybe I'll, I'll kick that over to, to Stephen if you have any uh, reflections on uh, on that point, because obviously for 20 years you've been engaged with grassroots. Right. Well, I, I think the the in addition to the 
to the civic and voter education messages <clears throat> that is the core of why we're doing the program, we're also working with these organizations to strengthen their capacity to continue to implement these and similar programs that, that, they, that they carry out absent our involvement with them or prior to our involvement with them. And I think the, 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 what I was saying in my remarks before is that people are very much interested in the process. They're not apathetic, they're apprehensive, but they're not apathetic mm -hmm. about the process and they want to know how it's going to work and what it will mean for them in, the, in their families in the future. And so there, that is an added benefit from taking an approach that works with community-based groups as opposed to direct implementation of a program like this, um, is that the, it is putting in place assets across the country which will have the capacity to continue to do these kinds of, of programs and, and to carry out other activities with other donors. Thanks. And can we get the mic over here? And then uh, as we're getting a little bit close on time, I'll move over, uh, over to you and we'll start bundling some questions just to make sure that uh, we get to hear from as many people as possible. Yes, uh, Will Farajaro, Strategy for Humanity. I, I, I apologize I came in late due to another commitment, so maybe you touched on this, but if you could speak a little bit to the media environment, uh, whether in, particularly in terms of politicization or incitement, um, how it's laying out in, 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 in the run-up to the elections. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you all very much. Ann Phillips, U.S. Institute of Peace. I have a very basic question. To hold elections, you need a credible level of security, very basic security. So what is the security situation across the country? One focuses mainly on Eastern Congo, which has been the hotbed of all this conflict. Uh, and what role are UN uh, peacekeepers playing in providing a, a credible level of security or a minimal level of security for elections to take place in that part of the country? Thank you. Excellent. Then maybe that's over to you, Stephen, since you work uh, with 90 radios and, and, uh, and perhaps can, can talk about the security, but certainly if, if others want to, to weigh in as well. Okay. Um, According to the electoral law, <clears throat> all of the polling stations will be secured by Congolese National Police. Um, and they played the same role during the voter registration uh, program. When we did some observing, um, we were frequently told by the police that they had not been fed, uh, received any, any rations or food for three or four days, that they'd been present there. Um, wasn't my role to determine whether that was um, true or not. Um, but keep in mind that the police and the military do not vote in Congo. So you're asking people to secure the elections that do not have a stake in it. And I think um, that could present uh, problems, but I think um, th there will be an attempt uh, by, the, by the security forces to ensure that there is a police presence at every one of the polling stations. Um, there, was, uh, there were reports during the voter registration uh, process that the police were engaging in corruption to move people forward in the, in the registration lines. Uh, the police force is, is um, generally engaged in different levels of, of petty corruption on a daily basis, and Congolese are aware of that and, and deal with it. Um, MONUSCO's security um, presence is primarily in the eastern part of the country um, and although they talk about um, being nimble and able to deploy rapidly, um, as was mentioned, it's, it's a huge country and um, that will be problematic in, in terms of um, of, of being able to deploy to numerous places if there are problems on election day. Um, the voter registration did take place in certain um, territoires and certain parts of the country that were under control of militia. 
um, and the CENI was able to deploy their, their um, registration um, offices and personnel to these uh, places and, and to my knowledge there were not issues with um, uh, preventing people from coming to register uh, by those uh, armed groups. And maybe do you have any reflection on some of the media stations that you work with, how they've been covering the elections, perhaps uh, the political, you know, the, the balance and, and diversity of, of political coverage? Um, I can't really comment on that. Uh, we provide the, the content to the radio stations and, or rather our partner does, um, but there, there are, um, there are certain stations in larger uh, media markets that have talk shows that bring in um, people to talk about the the, um, the elections to have to have exchanges. Yeah. Excellent, Mvemba, Alexis, do you want to comment on either of those yeah. those points, um, and then we'll do another round of. Uh, so I, I think I think Will's question about incitement and you know potentially hate speech, if that's the direction that you are going in. I mean, politicization, I think, is probably inevitable. It's a country with a lot of private media. Um, it's legal for political figures to own media outlets, so I'm not sure if that's a, I don't know, I come from a press freedom background. I would be loath to say that that's a problem in and of itself. Um, but uh, I think there are, there are, you know, there have, I don't, ha I don't actually have like sort of great authoritative statistics on this, but there have been periodic concerns over time about um, ethnic incitement or, or uh, hate speech by some private media outlets, some of them which may be aligned with political figures. I think the bigger concern in the media space right now is, is state constraints on uh, politically oriented broadcasting in particular. So one of the elements of the 2016 political agreement was the lifting of restrictions on certain opposition aligned media outlets and, and that um, has at best I guess been partially implemented and there have even been I think a few more closures after the 2016 uh, agreement. So I think from a press freedom angle there are certainly concerns about sort of a heavy handed media regulation um, or, a, or a politically biased media regulation. Um, but I think it's, it's um, it's worth following up on sort of the question of incitement or um, problematic broadcast content. Um, on Minusco's role and security, I mean, Mbemba certainly touched on security trends in his remarks, and you'll, you'll add on to that perhaps in, in a moment. But, um, you know, broadly speaking, the period of uncertainty over Kabila's succession, uh, so starting around 2015, let's say, as a benchmark, has coincided with a real increase in, um, in armed conflict in Congo. So what we see is that both the long-running uh, conflict-affected areas in the east uh, have gotten worse, and there's been an eruption of conflict in areas that had previously seen little, at least recent, organized uh, armed conflict. So the Kasai region stands out, the Tanganyika province in what was formerly uh, Katanga. Um, Ituri, to some extent, has, has seen a sort of a reignition of conflict. And those, um, that proliferation and sort of escalation of conflict uh, is, is, is uh, reflected in the humanitarian statistics for DRC. So a significant increase in the internally displaced population, um, a significant increase in the population assessed to be in need of humanitarian aid, um, and new problems for humanitarian access and sort of humanitarian aid providers. Um, so I think uh, you raise an important point that uh, one, one element of ensuring a credible election is ensuring that people are safe and able you know, to go out and vote and reach their polling station and then on the back end that results are able to make their way you know, to tabulation centers. That said, that is, you know, I think that's a real concern. It is also an issue that has been managed at least in previous electoral cycles. So I wouldn't say that it's um, the be all end all of whether the election is credible or not. Um, I would say that that proliferation of conflicts has led to a lot of speculation about why that is um, and plenty of sort of conspiracy theories more or less grounded 
some seemingly somewhat grounded in evidence of sort of political manipulation of of conflicts for the purpose of either, you know, take your pick, delaying the elections, uh, ensuring a skewed uh, representation of registered voters, um, intimidating people into uh, eventually voting a certain way. So um, these things do intersect both directly and indirectly. Um, Minusco has a, you know, has two elements of its core mandate that relate to this. Number one, of course, protecting civilians. So that's going to be a challenge if Manusco is already logistically challenged with um, responding to political violence in cities, where, which was not a major focus um, and ha it, you know, remains not a major focus of its uh, force deployment. Um, and then it is tasked with supporting the electoral process. So again, I touched on that a bit in my remarks, but those, those two elements of its mandate place it at the forefront, perhaps in responding to some of these issues, but maybe ill-equipped to do so. Yeah, thanks. I think maybe we'll take just cognizant of time. Let's take the second round of questions. And with that round, also, Mbemba, please feel free to, to weigh in on some of those earlier questions as well. Um, do we have? Thanks for the panel um, and the meeting. My name is Nicole Wittershine with USAID. Um, I had a comment that I'd like you to respond to, but also a question. Um, and Alexis was talking about this in particular, that the U.S. government hasn't come out and said uh, that following five reasons will be why this election is credible or not credible. The position that we have had is that the Congolese people will decide if it's credible or not. Um, and you know, so far, I think the majority of us that are trying to work on this issue um, and also what I've heard from um, folks I've been meeting is that that is the right position, that the Congolese people who have to vote in this election, who have to accept or reject these processes um, should be the determinant and, and that we shouldn't pre-cook that type of decision for them uh, by having some kind of checklist. Uh, however, the head of CENI, who worked for ISIS for many years, knows exactly what a credible election should look like. So um, there's already uh, inherent expertise in there, should they choose to use it. Um, I wanted to hear uh, about the, your, your thoughts on, we've started to get into this, on insecurity uh, and scenarios of violence. Both, uh, you know, the two key actors now that have thrown their hat into this race have demonstrated um, you know, both uh, have demonstrated the willingness to use violence, um, and they've gotten in, uh, unaccountable, they've gotten away with using that violence. Um, people have raised concerns to us about the post-electoral process uh, period and planning for violence, but like nobody really is telling us what to do or how to do that or how to plan for scenarios of violence and where. Um, so I think we're all super concerned there's definitely limitations on Monuk, so I'm wondering if there's things we could be doing at the grassroots level or other things that we should be considering aside from just sanctions and UN peacekeepers and then wagging the finger to everybody not be violent. So just love to hear your scenarios and, and maybe some recommendations. Thanks. I think I saw some questions, uh, those two, and then, let's, and then we'll come back to our panelists to, to close up and, and react. Yes, um, my name is Angelo uh, Sherti Mwembia from the DRC. I have a question for Mr. Vemba and maybe anybody else in the, on the panel. And thank you very much for the presentation, it's great. Um, I don't know if uh, anybody here is aware, especially Mr. Vemba, that um, 10.5 million Congolese have asked to have transition without the opposition and without the current regime. So uh, this has been conducted here in the U.S. by one of the scholar professor at MIT, Jean Bellet. Just want to know if uh, he is aware of that and what he think of it. Yes. And I think the the lady in the. Thanks to the panel. Um, I'm Judy Bilo, retired Foreign Service Officer. I was most impressed particularly with Mr. Mvemba's discussion of the context and subtext of everything in Congo. In 1993, a quarter century ago, I began a two-year tour in Kinshasa reporting on the pol political transition from Mobutu's government to a democracy. And mm -hmm. I can attest that the context and subtext have not changed 
and the same people in many cases, or their immediate family members are still contesting things in the same way. Way back then, the U.S. Embassy was working with grassroots groups, uh, civic education, preparing for e electoral ed um, education should the elections ever come. And we had some of the constant frustrations that also have not changed. Um, we political observers were endlessly frustrated that would-be opposition leaders always canvass the foreign embassies or nowadays send their lobbyists to Washington rather than seek support from the grassroots. And um, we also wondered of the grassroots, very excellent NGOs who were working hard to do outreach. One thing that is different is we did not have the massive political mobilization then that we have now. But um, did folks really, were they really committed to democracy, to understanding that this is a process for choosing our leaders and engaging with our leaders in governance? To what extent, and I wanted to ask, what's changed? Um, to what extent are leaders and wannabe leaders of today working to build support among Congolese rather than among foreign supporters? And to what extent do the Congolese themselves see democracy as a tool for governance or are they only supporting it to replace the current big man with one of their own choice? So thanks. I think that we'll take those uh, as our final questions. I'll invite each of the panelists also to give a, a bit of a, a final thought. Uh, and certainly, uh, we will keep to, to time, so we'll be, be prompt, but we do have the room for a little bit longer. So if people want to join uh, over some, some coffee to, to keep chatting, I, I think that would be, be certainly welcome. Uh, and maybe just before I break and hand it over, just a, a quick plug that in addition uh, to Mvemba's recent article, um, uh, Alexis has uh, a new report out published yesterday by Congressional Research Services. If you'd like to learn more about their work and, and in greater depth with uh, three times as many footnotes as her presentation uh, about U.S. Congo policy. Uh, and uh, for counterpart uh, and Stephen's work, they've been distributing some flyers, but certainly that would be available uh, online from any of our wonderful uh, counterpart colleagues uh, in, in the back as well. So with all of those um, uh, footnotes noted, um, please, uh, maybe we'll start with Stephen and then, then come down to, to react to, to some of those uh, in interventions and, and a final thought, if you, if you will. Um, <clears throat> I think the, I'll, I'll respond to the question about conflict. Um, I think that's uh, a very real, uh, a real concern and uh, a, a tough nut to crack because um, you can talk to people about the process, you can inform them how things should work, but there are any number of other factors which are mitigating against um, th that happening the way you would like. I mean, one of the, one of the issues in discussing post-electoral conflict me uh, mediation is that the courts are part of that process, and there's a real suspicion on the part of, generally, of Congolese about the legal system in the country and how reliable and how fair it is. And so to tell people that that's your recourse, even though that's what the electoral law says and that's what, you know, that's, that's the, the process, um, that doesn't give people a lot of comfort. And so you, you really need to be looking more towards um, alternative forms of mediation and those are really local level kinds of, of, of electoral conflicts, provincial level, I would say, and not national or, or national assembly level. Um, I, think, I think Congolese are, are aware of, of those issues and um, generally aware of manipul being manipulated um, and, and the potential for that. Um, we, uh, I should give a plug for our sponsors, which I neglected to do when I, when I uh, began speaking. Uh, we are implementing two programs in, in DRC. One is called Congo Democracia, which is funded by USAID and uh, also by UK through USAID. And a second one called Price, which is funded by uh, the Department of State. And in the, the, the latter program, uh, we have a, a particular focus on youth and, and uh, participation by youth in the political process, but also peaceful participation. 
and we <clears throat> uh, had an idea of, of structuring, structuring a radio talk show that would talk about, uh, that would bring in uh, experts or, or uh, content speakers to talk about different aspects of political participation and manipulation of youth. And we, initially it's, it's airing in Kinshasa right now and we're planning to expand it to several provincial capitals. And we found that people, again, as I mentioned, people are very interested in democracy and this show also hit a positive um, uh, response from people who would text or call in with comments about how, yes, that happens. Yes, there is manipulation. Yes, we should be focused on the, um, the result or the action that a political candidate is promising us and evaluate the quality of what they're proposing to do rather than a personality-based or an ethnic-based um, uh, scenario, and I think to get to your comment, if we compare Congo to the mid-90s and today, I think there's a greater maturity among people, a greater understanding, um, and, and, and a greater likelihood to hold um, political candidates accountable. I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's broad-based, but I think there's more of it than there was 25 years ago. Okay, so I'll touch on a couple of points. Uh, to go back to the question from Will on media, the other subgroup is social media. You know, and mm -hmm. social media actually have played a positive role in what's happening in terms of getting the message out, whether it's holding people accountable. And I'll just illustrate, uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a note uh, circulating. Literally, people leak things. <laughs> it's easy to leak on, on social media. So they leak a note, a letter from ex-minister to Kabila asking for X or asking for Z. It to be right on social media. And that minister will actually come to deny it on social media, which he may not do in Kinshasa. Right? So there's actually an entire world out there that is also watching what's happening. And they can give you timely information as it goes. Uh, in terms of uh, locally, you have like, um, Alexis was saying, you have groups like Lavnir that are clearly stated that we are with the regime. So you kind of know who you're dealing with from the beginning. There is no kind of subtext here, we're hiding everything else, no. Here, this is what we are. This is Digital Congo. You know what Digital Congo stands. So there's the Fox News and everything else in there as well. The local Fox News, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Congolese Fox News and stuff. Um, and then in terms of uh, what both Anne and Nicole ask, just quickly, we can talk more. You know, Congolese believe in something called the, La Stratégie du Chaos, which is the strategy of chaos, or La Stratégie de la Terre Brûlée. And it's a recent phenomenon, but they've really come to believe this, that the system, the Kabila system, thrives on chaos. And if they need, they need chaos to, to, do, to, to live. Some system are like that. Some system are parasitic, some system like hell. So it feeds on chaos and actually creates chaos. It allows them to play off the international community better. It gives them excuses. So Kasai, the crisis in the Kasai, Congolese say through that prism. The, the crisis in uh, uh, Ape Katanga, the uh, Ape Tanganyika also is seen through that lens. So that's something to keep. So in that sense, they believe the regime is quite capable in the next couple months or so to create another conflict that will derail the process. So that's Congolese sit in their own way. They have their own empirical evidence if you talk to them. <clears throat> uh, Angelo, to your question, I'll say, yes, I'm aware of this uh, movement. Uh, it's not just in the, in, in the US. It's also in the country in Congo, where a lot of people feel that Kabila has lost all credibility along with his associates, so you cannot really trust them to bring anything good at the end of this process. So the only way to circumvent that is to have a transition without him. And if they don't deliver over the next two, three months before the election, I think that we'll hear more of that in the, time, in the, year, in the, in the months to come. But it's, it's a movement that has got a lot of, a lot of energy, a lot of momentum uh, here and, and in DRC. 
anybody, any for people are now afraid to negotiate with Kabila or to come to his dialogue because nobody comes, everybody who goes there comes out weaker. Hmm. <laughs> right? So including the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church hesitated a long time to get involved. And what did they do? They got involved. The San Silvestre Accord happened. Who's suffering now is the Catholic Church. They have to reclaim the credibility in the eyes of the population. So people are now saying, no, no, you want to have your dialogue, I'm not coming. Because Kabila always gets more from the dialogue than anybody else who comes to the dialogue. Um, as far as the people uh, to Judith, so th that issue remains. I think Congo, because of the Cold War, the elite, the political, not elite, but the political people, uh, people in ruling position, always believe that Washington, especially Washington, will determine who the next president is. So they spend a lot of time here. Uh, those of us who live here tell them, look, you're wasting your time. We've already talked to everybody we need to talk. We need to talk to. They know what's happening. Nobody ignores. Just go build your momentum over there. And they just don't. Few of them do. But we think that with the youth movement and civil society, there's an entire segment of the youth movement and civil society who are anchored locally. Uh, most of them, nobody knows about them, but they're doing tremendous work on the ground. Um, as far as the people, the people are very committed to the process. I observe in the election 2006, in 2011, anybody else who observe will tell you how committed they are. Really committed to the process. So this is another one of that gap. And there's tremendous, um, the electorate is pretty sophisticated. Um, throughout all the electoral processes that we've had, 2003 with the transitional parliament, 2006 and 2011, nine, over 90% of the people get voted out. So there are actually very few Congolese in the parliament who can say, I've been in parliament since 2006 and I continue being elected. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a big turnout and that's because of the ballot. Mm -hmm. Even within that corrupt system, there's still that turnout. So they're very sophisticated that way. It doesn't let's come across. I think those are the three points I want to make. Um, this is a critical time for DRC. It sounds like any other time is critical, but this is very critical because, because Kabila needs to go. <laughs> and uh, if he doesn't go, it's just setting a bad precedent. It's like, are we a democratic republic or not? I mean, under Mobutu, we knew what we had. Okay, so it made sense within that context. Laurent Desiree, we knew what he wanted. Well, this is supposed to be a democracy, and taxpayers here have invested a lot uh, in DRC. We're still investing a lot, you know, the funding. What for? And uh, so we're really entering that zone where the proliferation of conflict can take us back to, 2000, to 2001. Or to, yeah, to 1996, 1996 when the GLPF began. Exactly. We really uh, get <laughs> Alexis. Um, it's tough to wrap up after. I think Mbemba should always be the last no. voice on uh, <laughs> these things. Um, but just to give a couple, to add a couple things to Nicole's point. So I, I'm aware of the talking point that the Congolese people will determine uh, the credibility of the election. I just, I don't think that actually answers the question of how the State Department will make, how and when the State Department will make that determination of what the Congolese people think. Um, so it raises some of the questions that Mvemba touched on when questioning, when describing diaspora opinion, you know, which Congolese, through what means, and when, you know, do we have the ability to gauge sort of whether the Congolese uh, accept the process or the outcome? Um, I think many Congolese would say, hey, we've been turning out in protests for two years. You know, we've been jailed and exiled and, you know, lost our livelihoods for speaking out against the current process. And we're telling these public opinion surveys that we don't trust the CENI. That's our message, you know, to the State Department that we don't think that this election is credible. Now, I'm not saying that that, you know, is a straightforward thing for U.S. policy, but I think that that's the challenge is sort of when and how and through what means and who, you know, do you listen to when making that assessment. Um, you know, I mentioned the scenario of an outcome, let's say if elections happen in December as planned, if Shadari is elected and local election observers say this is not a credible result, but you know, there's not a lot of options on the table for what do you do with that, and maybe the region says, hey, they've had a transition, and maybe even with some amount of reason, maybe the, the U.S. government would say, well, our top goal was a transition from Kabila to someone else, and 
you know, that happened. I think that that's a real challenge and that's, it's somewhat reminiscent but different of the 2011 outcome. So I don't think that it's sort of an answer to say, you know, the Congolese people will decide. I, I think that that raises more questions than it, than it answers. Um, I would, uh, and, and just to link that very briefly to, to the point that you made about grassroots movements and whether they've come under pressure in DRC, I mean, they absolutely have. You know, U.S. democracy and governance uh, assistance counterparts in Congo absolutely have come under pressure and have been arrested, and, and some of them are now living outside of Congo and unable to go back. Others are in jail or in various stages of criminal proceedings. So it's, um, it's an important component of U.S. assistance. It's been a consistent component of U.S. assistance, sort of support to, to grassroots movements and, and local civil society, but it's not, it doesn't necessarily, you know, it's not immune from political pressure and it doesn't necessarily protect people um, to say that they've been trained by the U.S. Yes, uh, well, on that, uh, on that note that, that underscores both the, the amount, the tremendous amount of things to watch over the coming months, but also the tremendous amount of work to be done by groups like Counterpart and, uh, and others, uh, let me just end by thanking you. This is the first in a series that we'll be having. Um, and, and thank you very much, Stephen, for spending your time uh, with us on cutting short your home leave and on your way back to Kinshasa. <laughs> so a speedy trip to you. Thank you very much to Mbemba and, and Alexis and to everyone who's uh, spent this uh, August morning with us. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.